Today, our presenter is none other than Sham Sam Kishnick. Sam has worn many hats in his love of nature. He was a naturalist at the Fort Worth Nature Center, a science interpreter with the Fort Worth Museum of Science and History, and a botanist with, with Brit. He is currently serving as an urban wildlife biologist with the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department serving DFW. Sam, welcome to the program. Awesome. Thank you so much, Courtney. Good to see you. Uh, good to see some names uh, here today. Um, today, we're going to have some fun talking about a little critter that doesn't get much appreciation. Um, and just real quick, I hope that everyone can hear my voice all right. I'm going to share my screen and start sharing my presentation. We're going to be talking about moths today. And these moths are really, really interesting. It's a big group of critters. And we'll talk about the reasons that they're well worthy of appreciation. Just real quick, if you have any comments or questions, or if you're having any audio issues or video, video issues, try to throw them in in chat and we'll try to get to those um, sometime. Uh, the questions and comments, we'll get to those at the end of the presentation. But Courtney, thank you for the introduction again. My name is Sam, Sam I am, and I, uh, I love all kinds of nature. Where I work is in the urban ecosystem. So I work in Dallas, Fort Worth. That is my jungle. That's my rainforest where I get to work and look at all of the neat and interesting critters and plants and fungi that live here with us. And we're going to start out with the general question. Um, if you have a yard or if you have a favorite park or a favorite place that you like to go outside, do you know all of the critters, the plants, everything that lives in your yard? The truth of the matter is, in the urban area in Dallas-Fort Worth, our yards are excellent refuges for so many different critters. And if you like birds, you need moths. You need these little bits of bird food, walking or crawling bird food that feeds, in all cases with our birds, they feed the little babies. Even the birds that normally eat seeds as adults, they're eating caterpillars and bugs as babies. So if you want birds, you need moths. So that's one of the big important things about moths. And it all goes back to this food web, this food chain, um, this, this group of all of the critters and what eats what. So all stages in the, the life cycle are food for others. So all stages in, in the life cycle of these moths, it's food for other things. And John Muir, a great naturalist, says, when we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it hitched to everything else in the universe. So in the case of moths, they're food for something that might be food for something else. So they are very, very important in the ecosystem. Now, some of our moths are agricultural pests. It's true that some of the caterpillars eat things that, uh, that maybe we eat. They eat the grains, the cereals, and in some cases, maybe our favorite sweater or sweatshirt. But this is a small, small percentage of all of the moths out there. There are very few of them that are actually considered pests of our food or of our clothes. Oops. So let's talk just briefly about the life cycle of a moth. And I'm not doing this to patronize you. I bet you know that a young moth is a caterpillar, that it turns into a cocoon, the pupa stage, the turn into the adult. But each one of these cycles can be kind of interesting and unique when it comes to our moths. We'll start out with the egg. So the eggs of our moths, 
typically with our moths and most groups of butterflies, the lepidopter, I'll talk about that in a second, they are laid on a specific kind of plant. So that uh, moth species or that butterfly species, it lays its egg on a plant that hopefully the young can eat. And kind of interesting, the very first meal that a caterpillar has is the egg casing. That's their first little meal is the egg casing. That protein egg shell basically is their first meal. And then we have the caterpillar stage. This is the larval stage of the insects in Lepidoptera in the butterflies and moths. We call this a caterpillar. In beetles, we call it a grub. Um, in flies, we call it a maggot. But in our, our butterflies and moths, we call it the, lar the caterpillar stage. And as I mentioned earlier, the adult butterfly is going to lay her eggs on a specific type of plant, and that caterpillar will eat that kind of plant. And that's essentially all they do. A caterpillar, it eats and it poops. Those are the two things that a caterpillar is good at uh, and avoid being eaten. So they are getting as much nutrients, as much energy for their next cycles. The cycle after the larval stage or the caterpillar stage is the pupal stage or the pupa. And in moths, we call this a cocoon. It's a little bit different, perhaps, um, in words at least, in, in the, the language. With uh, butterflies, we have a chrysalis. And the chrysalis for butterflies is typically up, a little bit higher up into the branches, into the stems of the plant. It sort of rests up there. With our moths, in many cases, the cocoon is in or on the ground. And it's one of the best reasons that we like to leave the leaves or at least leave some of the leaves. Those leaves create great habitat for the larval stage of our, our I'm sorry, for the pupil stage of our moths. The caterpillar goes down into leaf litter, rolls around in some of that leaf litter to make its cocoon or the pupa stage for the next stage. They can overwinter in some cases in this stage too. So when we leave the leaves, we're actually leaving habitat for our moths and for the bird food too. So then we have the adult stage. And in our moths and in our butterflies, this is sometimes the showy stage. Uh, it can be quite short for some. In the case of some of our moths, especially our larger moths, they don't even have working mouth parts. So all of the energy that they got from the caterpillar stage, that is used for the adult stage because they can't eat. They can't get any new energy. So that means it can be quite, quite short. Their objective is finding a mate, finding love and laying eggs. That is what they do and try to be avoid, eat, try to avoid being eaten in this stage. It's called the insect order Lepidoptera and Lepido means scale, Terra means wing. So the wings are full of scales. These can be pretty, they can be reflective, but they can also be lost. And if you've ever picked up a moth or a butterfly, you'll notice that kind of dust that comes off. Well, that dust is actually scales. We think that they evolved or adapted these scales for spider webs, that as they'd fly into a spider web, if they're able to lose some of those scales, it can save their lives. So these scales can be lost. And again, they can be quite showy and interesting in the adults. 
I'm not going to get too much into the weeds of the taxonomy of moths, but I really like what one of my auth one of the authors of a great book called For Love of Insects. He said butterflies and moths are kind of like Romans and barbarians. That during the Roman period, you would have the Romans and then everything else would be a barbarian. Well, we kind of look at butterflies as the Romans, the pretty ones, and then everything else is a moth. But the reality is there is so much diversity and beauty in the moths that it's really not that great of a designation or distinction between these two. If we are looking at some of the distinctions, the antenna is a place to look. Generally speaking, behaviorally wise, moths tend to be more nocturnal. There are some exceptions, whereas butterflies are diurnal or active during the day. But one of the pretty good distinctions is the antenna. With our moths, they can be pretty linear or feathery in the case of our male moths. And butterflies tend to have a clubbed antenna or basically a little club at the end of a stalk. That's one of the ways to tell a butterfly versus a moth. Now, kind of interesting, the males and the females are different with their antenna in the cases of moths. The males have feathery antenna or more feathery antenna than the females. They use these to sense the female. Those have the chemoreceptors where they smell the pheromones of the female antenna. So as we see our moths, let's try to think, is this a male? Is this a female? There's also way more moths than there are butterflies. Globally speaking, around 160 species or different kinds of moths, probably a lot more. In the United States, where we've documented quite a few moths, we have 13,000, over 13,000 species of moths. And in Texas, about 5,500 species of moths. If you're not good with numbers, that's a lot. That is a lot of diversity when we're looking at moths. And we can also have a little bit of differences in sizes. Obviously, if you have 5,000 different species, there's going to be some that are really big, some that are really small. The truth is most of the diversity comes in the little small ones. But again, we can have this spectrum of sizes. We sometimes group these as micro moths and macro moths or little ones and big ones. Eh, it's not that great of a designation. The little ones can be really little. This one is one that we have here in Dallas-Fort Worth on the left side or one of the sides of your screen. This is the chinkapin leaf miner, and it's three to four millimeters. So little itty bitty tiny moth. We also have one called the black witch, and this one has about a seven inch wingspan, quite large. So everything in between. On iNaturalist, a tool that we use uh, quite a bit, we've documented over 3,000 species of these moths in Texas. I love this tool of iNaturalist because you can filter. I'll talk about that in a little bit. But let's look at a few of these moth species together. And of the ones that I'm going to show, all of these are found in Dallas-Fort Worth. Um, all of these have been documented in Dallas County. So it's one of the things, hopefully keep an eye open. You might even see some of these in your yard or as you're out in town. The first one that we'll look at is the Polyphemus moth, named after the Greek Cyclops Polyphemus that was in, oh, the Iliad or the Odyssey, one of those um, Homer's tales. Uh, these guys have these fake eyes, and each wing has what looks like a single eye. This is a great defense to scare off uh, potential predators. If you have something that's looking back at you and it's as big as you are, the eyes, 
you typically want to avoid that. Your hunger stops and you start to flee. But in this polyphemous moth, it's a really, really showy one. These also don't have um, working mouth parts. They have vestigial or non-functioning mouth parts. So all of the energy they have, it comes from the caterpillar cycle. These typically feed on red buds. That's their host plant. I think a few other plants too. Another really, really nice one. These are typically more East Texas, but they do show up in Dallas and Fort Worth. Uh, the Luna Moth. This is a lovely, lovely moth. Quite large as well. Um, you can see Luna meaning the moon. They're out and active at nighttime. But we see these pop up in Dallas, Fort Worth as well. I talked about the fake eyes in our polyphemous moth. Well, the I.O. moth is another one. When they're hiding during the day, they'll have those wings hidden. But as they get spooked, they show off those hind wings and the big old eyes that look back at a potential predator trying to scare them off. This is a really, really neat one. It's called the Black Witch or Mariposa del Muerte, the Butterfly of Death. And some really interesting myths surround this moth. It's a big one. It's a whopper. This guy has a wingspan of about seven inches. So really, really big. But the myths are when you see one, it either means that it's a loved one that is visiting you that's passed away. It means that you might lose your hair. It means that you might win the lottery. Or it means that you might die soon. So I'm not sure if you get to choose which one of those it means. But it's kind of interesting when you get to see one. They're not all nocturnal. Some of our moths are active during the day. We call this diurnal. Or active at dawn and dusk. We call this crepuscular. In the case of this one, it's called the white-lined sphinx moth. And this is a butterfly or a, a nectar visiting, a flower visiting moth. So it's flying out during the day, during the dusk, during the dawn. And they're getting some of that high octane, that high energy nectar so that they can fly around and potentially find a mate on the wing. Some of these moths are just showy. They're showy. They have some really interesting colors. This is called the Allianthus webworm moth. It's another daytime flying moth, although you see them out at night as well. But look at the orange and the black and the white of this moth. Quite showy, quite pretty. It looks like you could pet this one. This is called the Southern Flannel Moth, and it does definitely look pettable. But if I show you the caterpillar, you may not want to pet it. This is the caterpillar. This is sometimes called the asp. And these feed on oak trees. And if you've ever pet one before, you know, because they have stinging hairs to keep them safe. So the asp caterpillar, it turns into one of these moths but the asp has these stinging hairs to keep them safe and to keep things from eating them or from touching them in the case of us. Some caterpillars, you know, are called pests. They're called pests because they can annoy us. They don't really do anything bad. You know, the asp, sure, it stings if you pet it, these can defoliate some of our pecan trees, the tent caterpillars. They congregate in groups and they form this silk structure around the leaves that they eat. It keeps them safe from birds in this stage. But as they go to form a cocoon, they have to leave the safety of that silken tent. And that's where they're predated upon by birds. Some folks, when they try to treat their trees for this, they'll use these sprays. Not very effective because the sprays don't get much past the silk. Other folks will chop off a limb. But I like to say, if you can let them be, 
they'll be bird food. They'll be bird food. So uh, it's good for the ecosystem if you can let them be. Last year, we had an outbreak of these caterpillars and this moth species that would defoliate a lot of our hackberries. And I've been seeing this in a lot of our hackberries again this year. These caterpillars go to the hackberry. The eggs are laid on a hackberry. The caterpillar will eat the hackberry, but they'll also form this silk around the leaves to keep, excuse me, to keep themselves safe from predation. So in some years, we have a boom cycle of a certain species and the plants, the host plants can kind of suffer during those boom cycles. One of my favorite moths, and it just shows the beauty of this type of insect. If you look closely at them, you can be blown away by the beauty and the intricacy of the patterns. This one is called the moon seed moth, and they feed on Carolina snail seed, uh, a native plant that we have in Dallas, Fort Worth. But man, do they just look tremendous in the adult stage. Some moths are told, you can tell them apart by the way that they rest, by the way that they sit. This is one called the egg, uh, the eggplant leaf roller. The eggplant leaf roller, it lives on things in the Solanaceae and the eggplant family. So the nightshades, tomatoes, potatoes, eggplants, these sort of things, that's what their caterpillars eat. But if you look at how they rest, that's got to be an advanced yoga pose where the little tiny hiney touches the nose. It's pretty incredible. You can see it on this white sheet, but if this moth were to be on a tree branch or some area with some lichen, it blends right in. So our moths can be really, really delicately and meticulously camouflaged to blend in with their surroundings. This is called the laudable arches. And if it's on some lichen, it blends in flawlessly. And speaking of lichen, and if you don't know what lichen is, lichen is that well, it kind of looks like a crust uh, thing on maybe some branches or rocks. It's actually a, a relationship between a fungus and a cyanobacteria. Well, there are some caterpillars that feed on that lichen. This is one called cystheny or the lichen moth, and the caterpillars eat lichen. The inchworms, geometrid, geo meaning earth, metrid meaning measuring. The geometrids like this one right here, the emerald moth, they look kind of pretty as adults, but check out the caterpillars. Do you see it? Do you see the caterpillar of this geometrid? It's kind of hard to see, but it's right there at the top. What this caterpillar does is it goes onto a flower, it nibbles off the flower petals, and it glues it to their backs. So it glues the flower petals to its back so it can blend in with the flower. Pretty tremendous. It creates its own camouflage. Here's another picture grabbing the little petals, grabbing the ray flowers or the disc flowers of a plant, gluing it onto its back, and then it blends in with the flower. Pretty amazing. What's also amazing is as the flowers, as they kind of fade and lose color, it replaces it with new, fresher flowers. Mind-blowing. Amazing. Another moth that we have has a cool name. The Jalisco petrophila is the name. It's actually an aquatic moth. The caterpillars of this species live in the water and eat some of the aquatic vegetation. But this one also has a unique look as an adult. And you can maybe see it. You might have to kind of tilt your head a little bit to see what it's trying to mimic. Do you see it? Let me show you what we think it's trying to mimic. Maybe it's trying to mimic a spider. 
And if you're a little bug, a carnivorous bug, like a praying mantis, and you see what looks like a delicious moth, but it also looks like a spider, this is a great way to keep itself from being eaten. So perhaps the wings mimic a jumping spider. And the last little moth that we'll talk about, this is a little tiny one. These are called leaf miners. And these leaf miners go under the tissue of a leaf and they form these kind of mazes. You can see the mazes in some of these leaves. And that's a leaf miner. The caterpillar goes right underneath the epidermis, grabbing some of that mesoderm to eat. And it forms this maze cycle in the, the leaf. So lots of really cool moths are out there. Maybe you want to go look, go look for some. And there are some really neat ways that you can go and look for moths. I know I shouldn't personify it, but I kind of do. I think that moths are just coming to our front door every night to wait for us to appreciate them. If you have a light on your outside, on your porch or on your backyard and you put out a little light, well, moths come to that light. They're just waiting to be noticed by us. So when and where do you look? Well, nighttime is the best time to look for moths. Ideally, if you have a place of relatively low light pollution, you know, when I go out of the city limits, I can see moths when I put up a light, and I do this quite a bit, but also in my own backyard. I live in an urban area, relatively suburban area in East Fort Worth, and I've got neighbors right there, right there, right there. And sometimes they'll have lights up, but I'll put out a little light and it's amazing to see the critters that come to it. Not just moths, but all sorts of bugs. The best results are when the weather is higher than 60 degrees. And if you live in Texas, this can be most of the year. Most of the year when it's higher than 60 degrees, that's when you can see the most moth diversity. And as a matter of fact, in some Januaries or Februaries, We'll get a little warm spell, and if it's above 60 degrees, I'll put out the black lights, I'll put out the moth lights, and some bugs do show up. We're not quite sure on why moths are attracted to lights. It could be navigation, that they're using a celestial body like the moon or the stars to fly around, maybe. It could be that the lights down here look like the moon reflecting on a body of water, perhaps. There's even some ideas that the wavelengths of ultraviolet activate some chemical receptor on the antenna. No one really knows for sure. And there's a fun book called Why Moths Hate Thomas Edison. And it talks about some of these unexplained uh, mysteries in nature. We don't know exactly why they come to lights, but they do. And that's a time that we can come uh, to those lights too and look at the critters that are attracted. If you want to attract uh, moths, pretty much any light can work. Uh, the incandescent ones, those work better than probably the LED lights. Um, but the UV lights, those uh, party lights that we get at party stores, or you can order them online too, relatively inexpensive. But that UV spectrum is a broader spectrum of light. And that really brings in a lot of these nocturnal bugs. If you're really, really into this, well, I, I definitely have gotten into mothing myself. Um, I will buy these specific UV lights to attract bugs and another one called the mercury vapor. Uh, mercury vapor, they're kind of hard to get a hold of. You got to get them online at some entomological websites. There used to be one called BioQuip that isn't active anymore. But this mercury vapor, really, really bright really, really hot as well, but an amazing spectrum of light that brings in so many different bugs. I'll also put a white sheet uh, behind or in front of that light. So it works a little bit like a reflection. 
So the, the light hits the white sheet and it basically blasts that light further off. Also, this gives the moths and other insects something to land on as I look at them uh, too. So I like to document these moths and other insects that come to these lights. I will use a little headlamp like this. I'll put a headlamp on, it frees up my hands, and then I'll also use my camera. So I use my camera, but our phones are pretty good too. You may have to play around with the flash on either your camera or on your phone. That's another reason why I put on my headlamp to sort of blast the moth with some light from my headlamp. And you may have to play with the light too. Those scales can be reflective. So um, it can be challenging, but I think it's well rewarding if you can get some good pictures. As you zoom in on those pictures, you can see more of those details of the moths. Once you get into this, and once you start to look at moths, it's fun to learn the names or try to learn the names of the different moths and other bugs that come to either your sheet or your front door if there's a light. It can be challenging. 5,000 species of moths in Texas just in Dallas, Fort Worth, we've documented over a thousand. It can be challenging to identify these. There are a couple field guides that exist. One of them that came out in the last few years is this one. It's a Peterson guide to the field, or it's a Peterson field guide to moths of southeastern North America. It's pretty good, but it doesn't have all of them. It may give you some guides or some guidance into narrowing down. But again, it's it doesn't have all thousand that we have in Dallas, Fort Worth, or all 5,000 that we have here in Texas. So it just gives a few of them. There are some great websites for this. There's one that's designated for moths, and it's out of Mississippi State, Moth Photographers Group. I use this site and I basically just go through the pictures and kind of go, yes, 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 maybe, no, yes, no, yes, maybe, yes, no, maybe. And I click on the ones that it kind of looks like and it gives me that further guidance. There, there's a walkthrough plate series on this too. Another website, great website, bug guide, not just for moths, for all bugs uh, that we have here in Texas and in, I think, North America at least north of Canada. Browsing through the families of these, kind of like the plate series of the Moth Photography Group, you can submit pictures too. If you do, try to get it as clear as possible and cropped or narrowed down, focused just on the moth. You can submit this, and there are some reviewers and entomologists that use this too. This is the website that I use the most. It's called iNaturalist. I hope you're familiar with it. It is a citizen science or community science a web page. There's an app as well. It's a community. It's a social network where we engage with nature and share that, that um, experiences with other people all around the world. This does, if you use it for moths, to get a good ID, you really need to try your best, your very best to get a clear picture, a in-focus clear picture of the critter. You can post anything on iNaturalist, any living organism, but for moths, we really need to try, get, try and get the clearest, most in-focus picture that we can. Not going to get into the weeds of, of how to use iNaturalist, but you need to be patient too. So it is growing exponentially. So it can be hard, difficult to get identifications for some of these things. For moths, it may take a little bit of time to get an identification for these. So as you submit observations, try your best to be patient too. And try your best to identify it as you can. So if you know it's a moth, you can put in Lepidopter or moth for it. But scroll through those moths and see if you can see ones that look kind of like it. Did you know that there's a National Moth Week? And it's actually International Moth Week. People from around the world 
explore, appreciate, and document the different moths that we share the planet with. And this can be from um, Malaysia. They can be from New Zealand. They can be from, um, from Europe, from Abilene. And here in Dallas-Fort Worth, we're celebrating National Moth Week too. It is July 22nd through the 29th. If you use iNaturalist, they're automatically grabbed uh, to join this project for the National Moth Week. And there are some public mothing events. Now, I'm going to leave this screen up for a little while if you want to either take a picture or write some of these down. These are events free, open to the public, no registration needed. Just come on and join us. Um, they're all, we call it eight to late. So 8 p.m. till, you know, later. It's a come and go sort of thing. Uh, again, no registration needed. So just come. These are all in public spaces too. So tonight, actually, we are going to be doing a black lighting or a mothing event at Oak Point uh, Park and Nature Preserve. This is in Plano, Texas. And I don't have the directions for any of these. If you Google or look online or even maybe put it in Google Maps, hopefully you'll get some of these. You might have to do a little bit of digging to see exactly where they are. But we've got a lot of events. So tonight at Oak Point Preserve in Plano, this is on a Saturday tonight. Uh, we have one on a Sunday in La at in Duncanville at a Lad Natural Area. We've got one on a Friday night on July seventh at Brookhaven College. There's we're celebrating National Moth Week, and this is the start of it on July twenty second in Garland, the 25th in Arlington, the 28th in Seagaville, the 29th in Acton, close to Granbury. So all over Dallas-Fort Worth, we've got these events where we come out with all of the equipment. We come out with sheets, with lights, um, and all you need to bring is your curiosity. If you have a flashlight, great. If you have a camera, even better. And hopefully you can come and engage with nature and also engage with other naturalists, with other people that are into this stuff. There's going to be a lot of master naturalists at each of these events. So if you're able to, please come and join us. There's also books that help you uh, guide the landscaping in your yards for butterflies and for moths. This is a great book. Uh, written by the Webbers, Native Host Plants for Texas Moths. This gives you some suggestions of the native plants that you can use to attract certain moths. And this is the point. So I always love to address the relevancy question, the who cares on, in some cases, my favorite thing, who cares about moths? And sure, the moths are the food for other critters, so it's a sign of a healthy ecosystem, but it also gives me some idea of the plant populations or the plant health in an area. If you have a lot of species of moths, you probably have a lot of species of plants. Those moths may be specific to certain types of plants, so the moth diversity is correlated with the plant diversity. The more plants, the more species of plants that you have in your landscape or at your favorite park, that means that there's going to be more species of moths. The more species of moths you have, the more species of bugs and things that eat those moths. The more species of birds, the more things that may eat those birds, hawks, owls, mammals in some cases. So it's really part of the healthy ecosystem that we can see and we can study this and measure this by looking at the moths. So I encourage you, if you're able to, put some different plants in your landscaping. Suggest some different uh, plants at your favorite parks with the Parks and Rec Department. So you can do this for the good of the moths and also the good of nature and the healthy ecosystem. 
Um, with that, I would love to open it up for any questions or comments. Um, I have my email address down below. I'm also very active on iNaturalist. You can uh, tag me in any of your observations. If you do a little at sign, Sam Biology, all one word, all merged together, the at Sam Biology, this notifies me of your observation. We also have a little survey. If you'd like to do a survey, um, I have a QR code for that. You can scan that if you'd like. I'll leave this up for just a second uh, before we start taking any comments or questions. But again, thank you so much for your time today. Hopefully, if you're able to come to any of the public moth events, you're totally welcome to. Um, and, you know, if you're able to stay up a little bit at night in your own backyard and maybe your neighbors, your moms, your dads, your aunts, your uncles or a friend's place, if they've got a porch light, take a look at some of the, the critters that we share the urban ecosystem with. And it's well worthy of celebration. So I will stop sharing my screen so I can look at the chat. And I'll address some of these questions. Um, Ivan Elliott says, hi, Sam. Hello. Ivan, you mentioned using black lights and moth lights to find them around your yard. How do you do use them? And what's a moth light? And then you said, ah, you explained right after I asked. That's okay. No worries. Um, so I get these black lights. You can go to a party store. You can also go online, um, Amazon, if you'd like, look at some of the the party lights, the UV lights, they have some that are relatively inexpensive, 10 bucks or so that you can plug in with one of the little um, cords like this, either into an outlet or to a battery pack. Uh, and those can work really, really well, surprisingly well, even in deeply light polluted urban ecosystems, some of the bugs will still come to them. Uh, Jessica, you asked, do moths sleep and how long do they live in the adult stage? Great questions, Jessica. So do moths sleep? Um, you know, they probably kind of chill out and wait. I don't know if it's a, what's that REM, REM sleep? I don't think it's really any of that, that they just, you know, get some Zs during the day. They will find little spots where they hide. With a lot of our moths, this is underneath things, underneath leaves. And you've seen it probably as you've walked out in tall grass or in some leaf litter, some bugs that start to fly off. Some of those are moths that were sitting underneath the leaves or underneath that branch waiting for the nighttime. Is it sound sleep that they're getting? Probably not, probably not. You know, probably a lot of our moths are on edge because they're not getting great sleep throughout the day. They are trying to stay alive, trying not to be eaten by other things. And there's so many birds and spiders and potential predators out there. It's not easy being a moth. And uh, you asked, how long do they live in the adult stage? This really depends on the species. On some of them, especially like the big ones, like the Luna moth and the Polyphemus moth, it can only be a week. They don't have working mouth parts, so no energy they can absorb. It's all the energy from their, their caterpillar stage. So they may not live too long as adults. Other ones, like the white lion sphinx, it's getting that constant energy from the, the flowers it visits. So it may live a little longer. But even a long lifespan for a moth is around a month. So they don't really live too, too long. Great questions. Um, really, really good. If there's any other questions, please ask them uh, now. You can also, again, send me some messages on either iNaturalist or on email. But with that, uh, again, thank you so much for the time. And Courtney, I'm not sure if you're still on right now. If you have any announcements or any comments, that would be great. And if not, not hearing anything, uh, again, thanks for your time. 
uh, really, really appreciated it. Um, I will uh, stop sharing right now. Hope to see some of y'all at some of the public um, events. Oh, and Courtney, I see you're unmuted now. Oh, I was just saying, um, for anyone interested, we have the Nature Expo um, here at the Central Library in um, downtown Dallas on Saturday, July 15th. So come on out. Um, we have different programs or in, in organizations who come together year after year to present this um, information on Native Dallas. Cool. Awesome. Well, again, y'all have a great day. Hopefully you can go outside some today, engage with nature, drink water. I think it's going to be fairly warm uh, as well.